Demo Knight TF2. This subclass has gotten a cult following over the past few years, and it's not hard to see why. In a game where you can use sniper rifles, rocket launchers, and this thing, there's something to be admired about the guy that goes, fuck that, and opts to fly across the map with nothing but a sword and shield. Though at this point, calling Demo Knight a subclass isn't doing it enough justice. Unlike other subclasses like Fat Scout and Trolger, which are centered around a single weapon, Demo Knight has a lot of options at his disposal. Even if you only count the booties, shields, and swords as Demo Knight weapons, that still adds up to 9 unique unlocks. But, of course, it wasn't always this way. When was Demo Knight first added to the game, and how has he changed over the years? That's exactly what I'll be covering in this video. Strap in, because this is going to be a wild ride, filled with meta-breaking weapons and game-breaking exploits. Our story begins with the war update of December 2009, where demo men and soldiers fought over the iconic gunboats. Although it was Soldier who eventually won, demo man still made it out of the war with two game-changing unlocks of his own. Two unlocks that turned the idea of what it meant to be a demo man onto its head, the Charge and Targe and the Eyelander. And of course, with these two items, what we now call the Demo Knight was born. Let's look at the Charge and Targe first. By far the most striking difference between the Charge and Targe on release and the Charge and Targe today is its resistances. On release, the Charge and Targe granted demos a 50% fire resist. The same as today, but also a whopping 65% explosive damage resist. Looking past the resistances, the Charge and Targe also came with an entirely new charge mechanic. Right clicking with the Charge and Targe equipped catapulted you forward in a straight line, and the length of your charge could boost the damage of your melee. The Charge and Targe was clearly designed as a way for melee users to close the gap between themselves and their target. But what would be the point of that without a powerful melee weapon to use? That's where the Eyelander came in. The Eyelander functioned the same as it does today. Increased melee range, a minus 25 health penalty, and the ability to collect heads on kills to increase your max health and speed. When paired together, the Charge and Targe and Eyelander created a new playstyle that had never been seen prior one that combined high bursts of speed with powerful melee attacks. This playstyle was especially odd on Demo Man, who was otherwise slower than most classes and was weakest in close quarters. Regardless, it was clear that Valve had struck gold with this concept, as most feedback from players was extremely positive. Skipping ahead to January of the following year, the Charge and Targe had its explosive resist nerfed for the first time going from 65% down to 50%. This was still pretty ridiculous, seeing as this still surpasses the modern day Fist of Steel resistances, but at least Valve's on the right track. And in April, the Charge and Charge was buffed, with its Shield Bash now dealing 50 damage along with an additional 10 damage for every head you've collected with the Eyelander, up to a maximum of 5 heads. This patch also addressed the first of many charge-related exploits. Players had discovered that by using scripts with the plus left and plus right commands while charging, they could do this. Basically, the plus left and plus right commands allowed Demo Knights to take much sharper turns than were originally intended. Valve was relatively quick to patch this out, seeing as this was only a few months after the Charge and Targe had been released, but this certainly isn't the last exploit that we'll cover in this video. Following this patch, on the very next day in fact, was the 119th update. The Charge and Targe had its explosive resist nerfed yet again, going down from 50% to 40%. Fun fact, 
This is also when the Charge and Targe went from its original team colors to its curtain day yellow version, which was changed in order to make the shield stand out more and make it easier to identify. In the following month of May, Demoman received a new melee in the form of the Scotsman Skullcutter. This weapon had a 20% damage bonus and a minus 15% move speed penalty, like it does today. But that move speed penalty was active at all times, even when the weapon wasn't active. It's because of that move speed penalty that Demo Knights generally preferred the Islander over the Skullcutter, since being slow is counterintuitive to killing people with melee. Skipping to the following month yet again, the Islander was changed in the Mac update of June 2010 to collect any heads inside the Islanders of opposing Demonites, which could be considered both a buff and a nerf, depending on whether you're the one stealing heads or having your heads stolen. Ending the year with the Australian Christmas update, the Islander received its first real competition with the release of the Claydemore. This sword granted a 0.5 second increase in charge duration in exchange for a minus 15 max health penalty, letting Demonites secure kills that would otherwise be outside the range of their charge. And of course, I can't have a Demonite history video without bringing up Demopan, which was posted on r slash tf2 in December of 2010. This post was originally intended to highlight the decline in TF2's art style, which is ironic given how tame it is by today's standards. And that concludes Demo Knight's first full year in the game. Nothing crazy so far, just a few charge and charge tweaks and some additional melee options. Let's see where Valve takes this subclass from here. Starting off the new year of 2011 was a new melee in the form of the Half Zatoichi as part of the Shogun Pack of March. Originally, the Half Zatoichi healed you up to 100% health upon killing with it, and could even deal random crits, which gave Demonites greater longevity after killing someone, especially if they used up their charge to do so. This concept was also seen with the Spy's Kunai, which was also released in this update. As for downsides, the half of the Toichi had a big one. Once it was deployed, you couldn't put it away until you got a kill with it, meaning you'd be unable to use your grenade launcher. It's because of this downside that the half of the Toichi was unable to dethrone the Islander as the quintessential Demo Knight melee, but it was still a nice alternative to have. Speaking of the Islander, it and the Claydemore were nerfed heavily in the Hatless update of April with their no random crit penalties being replaced with a minus 25% damage penalty. It's kind of an inside joke at this point that no random crits doesn't do much in terms of a weapon's balance, but most players felt that the health penalties of the Islander and Claydemore were enough to keep them in check, and that these new damage penalties were overkill. With the two best melee options nerfed into the ground, it seemed as though Demo Knight was destined to be nothing more than an unviable gimmick. That is, until the very next day, when Valve reverted these changes. Yeah, people were not happy about this, especially since Valve had applied this change to other weapons as well, like the Gunslinger. It's funny to see Valve revert a change so quickly, but it's also good on them for being receptive to the community's feedback. And, as if to apologize for the attempted nerfs back in April, the Uber update of June saw Demonite go far beyond the one-note gimmick that it had been up to this point, with not one, not two, but three new meta-changing unlocks. Let's start with the Alibaba's Wee Booties. This item takes up your primary slot, meaning you lose your grenade launcher, but in exchange, you gain an additional 25 max health and a plus 100% increase in turning control while charging. With the booties, there were now subclasses within the subclass of Demo Knight. Full Demo Knight, which used the booties and were therefore melee only, and Hybrid Knight, 
which stuck to having a grenade launcher as well as their melee. The extra health granted by the booties let demonites take more risks with their charges, and the increased turn control allowed them to connect shield bashes and crit melee swings more easily. And speaking of shield bashes, let's talk about the next new unlock, the Splendid Screen. From the very start, the Splendid Screen was clearly designed to be a more offensive charge and charge with lower resistances but far greater shield bash damage. The release of the Splendid Screen also came with a change in how the game determined whether your melee would crit or not after a charge. Up until this point, your melee would only crit if you were in the red zone of your charge, meaning you had to be a specific distance away from your target. As of this update, however, you would always crit your melee if you swing it immediately after a shield bash regardless of the distance. This was a huge buff, as it meant Demonites could one-shot people with a shield bash into crit combo much more consistently, especially when you consider how the booties made connecting shield bashes even easier. Lastly, we have the Persian Persuader. Upon release, the Persuader granted a plus 100% increase in charge recharge rate. This perk alone was appealing as Demonite has always been limited by his charge meter, and being able to charge more often meant being able to escape or chain kills more quickly. But what pushed the Persuader into arguably broken tier was its other perk. All ammo collected was converted into health. This did mean that the Persuader was a less consistent option for hybrid knights, but it also meant that a Demonite using this sword was pretty much always going to be at full health. The amount you healed with this thing on release was insane. It was like the half Satoichi on steroids in that regard. It was a very strong contender for the best Demonite sword, at least for full Demonite. So those were the three new weapons. That's all for Demonite, right? Not quite, because this update also brought some changes to the charge mechanic itself. First off, yet another charge turning exploit was fixed this time involving scripts that use keyboard commands when turning to, again, allow for far greater turn control than intended. The way charging interacts with air blast was also changed, with the charge meter no longer being fully depleted if interrupted by air blast. But by far the biggest change was that charging was now able to be done in mid-air. At first, this sounds like nothing more than a nice quality of life change, but then players discovered that they were able to do this. This is trimping. There are plenty of videos on YouTube that explain trimping much better than I ever could, but basically, by jumping and charging up an incline, you trick the game into thinking you're super slippery and fly into the air. And by the way, there were still more charge turning exploits that hadn't been fixed at this point, which allowed a trimping demonite to maneuver himself mid-air. It really can't be overstated how important trimping is. It's a staple of high level demonite play even to this day. With all that being said, we're finally done with the Uber update. And although there are still 6 months left in the year, Demonite only saw one more major change past this point, with that being a Persian Persuader nerf in the Maniversary update. Demonites using the Persuader could no longer receive ammo from dispensers or a payload cart, making Hybrid Knight even less of a viable option for it. Additionally, the amount of health received from fallen weapons and destroyed buildings was significantly reduced. In retrospect, this nerf was bound to happen. Thankfully, the Persian Persuader was still a fine option afterwards, as it still had that faster charge recharge perk, and some health regain is better than nothing. And that concludes Demo Knight's second full year in the game, and boy was it a good one. The new unlocks gave Demonites more options than ever, and the introduction of Trimping raised the skill ceiling exponentially. It was a great time to be a Demonite player, 
But trust me, we aren't even close to Demon Knight's peak yet. Compared to 2011, the following two years were comparatively quiet. 2012 saw no major changes. In July of 2013, the Charge and Charge was buffed to grant immunity to Afterburn, although the Splendid Screen was still the preferred shield. And in October of the same year, the Eyelander was changed to make the Demo Man's eye glow green when you claim heads with it. That brings us to 2014, and we begin the year in April with two major exploit fixes. On April 1st, charging was changed so that it is no longer FPS based. Prior to this update, playing with a higher FPS allowed for greater charge turn control, which technically gave players with more powerful computers an advantage. The second exploit fix of this month was much more substantial. Following the keyboard command exploit being fixed way back in 2011, players had discovered a new charge turn exploit this time with scripts that use joystick inputs to, you guessed it, allow for far greater turn control than intended. And as of April 24th, it became yet another exploit to be patched by Valve. By this point, charge turn exploits had been in the game in one form or another for over four years. Over this time, many Demonite players had become accustomed to playing with these exploits and therefore saw these fixes as major nerfs. And like in 2011, Valve was quick to completely revolutionize the Demonite meta once again, as if to apologize for the nerfs. Because two months later, with the Love and War update of June, Demonites were blessed with possibly one of the most overpowered weapons to have ever existed in the game, the Tide Turner. So what made the original Tide Turner so broken? Well, the stats are a good place to start. Upon release, the Tide Turner granted 25% fire and explosive damage resists, which was even more than the Splendid Screen offered. Melee kills while charging also fully restored your charge meter, meaning you could charge a second time immediately after killing someone. But by far the biggest selling point of the Tide Turner was that it granted full turn control, almost like Valve was inspired by all the charge turn exploits that they were fixing. This increased control made landing shield bashes much easier and allowed for insane trimping potential. Lastly, unlike today, the Tide Turner allowed for a full crit at the end of its charge. Keep in mind that this was still back when melee crits were guaranteed immediately after a shield bash which was easier than ever with how quickly you could turn. When you combine all of this together, it's easy to see why the Tide Turner instantly became the standard for Demo Knights. The other shields simply couldn't compete, and even the booties were practically obsolete as its increased turn control was outdone by the Tide Turner. This meant that Hybrid Knight was actually the preferred way to play Demo Knight. As for which swords paired well with the Tide Turner, the Islander and Claydemore were good options as always, but the most infamous combination was the Tide Turner with the Half Zatoichi. Recall how upon release, the Half Zatoichi healed you to full, and could even random crit to boot. Pair that with the chain killing potential of the Tide Turner, and you had a Demonite that acted as a one man army, charging back and forth between enemies and constantly healing back to full in the process. This update was a game changer for Demo Knight, even more so than the Uber update back in 2011. The Tide Turner was pretty much the perfect Demo Knight shield, so it should come as no surprise that it'd eventually be knocked down a peg. And that time would come 6 months later, with the Smith Smith 2014 update. This update brought two hefty nerfs for the Tide Turner. 
First, melee kills while charging now add 75% to your charge meter instead of 100. This meant no more instant charge kill chains, with two exceptions, which I'll get to in a minute. The second nerf was even more severe. An added penalty which made taking damage while charging reduce the remaining charge time at a rate of 3 per point of damage. So, for example, hitting a charging demonite with just 20 damage would deplete 60% of his remaining charge. On paper, this new penalty was a smart decision from Valve, as it's otherwise hard to outplay a demonite charging at you with full turn control. But the rate of 3 per point of damage was way too harsh as a single clean shot on you could completely wipe your charge meter. This update wasn't all bad news for Demonite, however, as some of his other unlocks received some small buffs. The crippling speed penalty of the Scotsman Skullcutter was changed to only apply when the weapon is active, making it a more viable choice for hybrid knights than before. The Claydemore and Booties gained a new perk of adding 25% to your charge meter on a charge kill, which could be combined with the Tide Turner to allow for full charge restores on kill once again. The booties also had their turn control bonus doubled, from 100% to 200%, which helped soften the blow from the Tide Turner's nerf. And with that, 2014 comes to a close. This has been the most hectic year for Demonite by far starting with major exploit fixes before being blessed with the absurdly powerful Tide Turner, only for the Tide Turner to be gutted by December. And unfortunately, it doesn't get much better for Demonite from here. Skipping ahead to the gunmetal update of July 2015, Demonite actually received some nice buffs here. The booties were buffed to grant an additional 10% move speed bonus. This was huge for Demonite, as speed is crucial for closing the gap if you're relying almost entirely on your melee. This allowed Demonite to just barely outpace classes like Pyro that run at 100 hammer units per second, and an Eyelander Demonite with 4 heads and the booties equipped was now even faster than a scout. Additionally, the Tide Turner had its nerf from the year prior scaled back. Self damage and fall damage no longer decrease your charge which aided in elaborate trimping setups, and the amount of charge reduced from taking damage was lowered from a rate of 3 per point of damage to 1. Obviously, the Tide Turner was still nowhere near as dominant as it was in 2014 after this buff, but maybe that's for the better. Now Demonite has a handful of viable options at his disposal for both full Demonite and Hybrid Knight. But just as things were looking hopeful for Demonite players, Tough break happens just 5 months later. I thought Pyro players had it bad with their changes in tough break, but they're nothing compared to what was done to Demonite. Nearly every staple Demonite weapon was changed in some way, and most of these changes were for the worse. First and foremost were several changes made to charging, and therefore applied to all of the shields. The damage boost applied to your melee from charging was changed to be percentage based, with it now providing a mini crit at 25% charge depleted and a full crit at 60% depleted. This is basically how charging has always functioned, but it also removed the mechanic of getting a guaranteed crit after a shield bash. Now, you have to have charged a certain distance before you can get a crit which meant Demonites would need to work much harder in order to achieve those shield bash crit combos. On the bright side, charging now removes debuffs like Jurati and Afterburn, which is a nice buff, albeit a relatively minor one. Looking at the shield individually, the Charge and Tart had its explosive resist nerf for the third time, now dropping from 40% to 30%, and its Afterburn immunity was removed. The Splendid Screen, on the other hand, was actually buffed, with it now granting a 50% faster charged recharge rate and a 5% greater explosive resist, although the removal of guaranteed melee crits after shield bashes meant the Splendid Screen was still arguably nerfed overall. The TIE Turner possibly had it the worst out of all the shields. Its resistances were reduced to 15%, and it could no longer grant full critical hits at the end of its charge only mini crits at most. 
Looking now at the swords, they also received a universal change, with them now having increased deploy and holster time penalties. This change didn't affect full Demonite loadouts, as they can't switch weapons to begin with, but it did serve as a new punishment for hybrid knights that switched to their melee at an inopportune time. As for the individual swords, the half Satoichi was changed so that it gains 50% health on kill that can overheal, as opposed to the previous 100%, and its honor bound mechanic was changed to deal 50 self damage if you put it away without getting a kill whereas before, you couldn't switch weapons at all. The Persian Persuader was also reworked. Picking up ammo now replenishes your charge meter as opposed to restoring health, and you gain an additional 20% to your charge meter for every hit you land with it. And just to make extra sure that the Persuader is only used on full Demonite like Valve originally intended, it gains a new penalty of reducing your primary and secondary ammo by 80%. These two swords weren't nerfed so much as they were tweaked, and one could even argue that they were buffed, with the half Satoichi becoming more viable in Hybrid Knight due to it now allowing you to switch weapons, and the Persian Persuader allowing for chaining charges reminiscent of the original Tide Turner. The same couldn't be said about the Claydemore, however, which was completely gutted for seemingly no reason. Its unique charge duration bonus that it had had since 2010 was removed and in its place, it gained plus 25 health on kill. Its health penalty was also replaced with a 15% damage vulnerability when active. Of all the changes made to Demonite in this update, this one was by far the most baffling, as the Claydemore had never been as powerful as other unlocks like the original Tie Turner or Persian Persuader. Regardless of Valve's reasoning, the Claydemore was left with no identity, if you wanted a sword that specialized in regaining charge, you'd use the new Persian Persuader. And if you wanted a sword that could heal you on kill, you'd use the half Satoichi. Just like with Combo Pyro in my last video, Demonite was hit hard by Tough Break. No more guaranteed crits after shield bashes, the Tide Turner getting nerfed yet again, and the Claydemore getting gutted so hard that it might as well not even exist. But whereas Combo Pyro was somewhat revived come Jungle Inferno, Demonite hasn't really seen any notable buffs since Tough Break, which was several years ago at this point. Really, the only notable buff Demonite has received since then was the Claydemore being reverted back to its original design in Jungle Inferno. But can that really be called a buff when that's the state it should have always remained in? And it was also in Jungle Inferno that the changes made to Air Blast, like a minus 75% air control penalty for anyone air blasted until they land, made Pyro counter Demonite harder than ever before. And past Jungle Inferno, the only notable changes Demonite has seen were in October and November of 2020, in Manpower of all things, where he was nerfed. So, since the introduction of the Charge and Targe in Islander way back in 2009, the Demo Knight subclass has seen a lot of highs and lows, and it's unfortunate that he's ended on a relatively low note. With that being said, however, is Demo Knight bad today? I wouldn't say so. All of the components that have made Demo Knight a force to be reckoned with in the past are still present today. The snowballing, pub stomping effects of the Islander, the ability to one-shot most classes with a shield bash followed by a crit melee, trimping across the entire map. Accomplishing these things may be more difficult than they were during Demonite's peak back in 2014, but that isn't necessarily a bad thing considering how absurdly strong he was at that time. So if after watching this video, you're in the mood to try Demonite out for yourself, go ahead and give it a shot. Even though he's technically not a class of his own, he still has enough weapon variety and a high enough skill ceiling to keep you hooked for hours on end.